Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for the highlight of this afternoon? Platformification. Now there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the main hall, the highlight of the afternoon, platformification. Komt allen. All right, everyone. We're about to get started again on the main stage. Bring it on. Hello. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see you again. And uh, we're very much looking forward to the next session about platformification. Hello. This is really what it's about, right? So we know that this is really what's going to make a difference because everyone wants to be the platform. Uh, like just everyone wants to be a business leader. And there was always the question is who's going to be the business follower, of course. Uh, and if everyone's a platform, who's actually making use of all these platforms? But then again, it's a big battle, I think, for uh, the power play in the, uh, in the industry. So and we've got some powerful people here. Uh, to start with our moderator, uh, Brian van Wachem of RedSnap. Definitely the guy to know about you know, getting into your markets and getting people to see your power. Uh, uh, I want to give you the floor to take it away and introduce your panelists. Have a great time. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, sit tight, hang in, and uh, we're going to start. So. Welcome to uh, the panel discussion. I will introduce you a little bit later, but first, of course, we're going to explain a little bit why we are talking about platformification, right? So, one, it's a hot topic, yes. Secondly, I think we see a, um, a number of different business models evolve, emerge from this, yeah? And, uh, and obviously, we're all very curious, you know, the end customer. So, what he has to gain? So in the next 45 minutes, we're going to learn and we're going to answer the question, what is platformification? Because we're going to start with that. And uh, also, what is the benefit for ultimately the client? Yeah? So but before we, we do that, I first want to introduce you this um, very diverse panel. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> all white men. <laughs> nice. But uh, unfortunately, but they're all very wise, so that's, uh, that's good. So uh, the first, um, uh, yeah, Richard Straver. Yes. Uh, and Richard Straver, he is um, the founder of Online Payment Platform, and Online Payment Platform is a payment service provider for platforms and marketplaces. Yeah, that's uh, good for now. Um, and then we have, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Derks. Yeah. yeah, and Mr. Derks is um, head of desk. You need to explain that later on. Head of desk, yeah, of IBAN First, and IBAN First is basically providing a platform for doing international payments. Yeah. Um, then we have uh, Jeroen de Bel, and Jeroen de Bel is the founder of Fincoch. Fincoch is a uh, fintech consultancy group, and basically supporting banks on their digital journey. Yeah. And we have, and we have uh, Kees Jan, but forget about Kees Jan for the English speaking, so we call you KG, KJ, yeah? KJ, <laughs> yeah. KJ. Uh, Kopenau from Mambu, and Mambu is a um, uh, SaaS core banking platform provider. Yeah? Okay. So welcome, uh, panel, uh, all the, uh, yeah, uh, you're all here. Um, so let's kick off immediately. Um, let's talk about platformification, because when I studied the subject, I was uh, reading about platformification, and I think that we all want to know what is it are we really talking about? What is platformification? So, to, to make it easy, I'm going to ask you everyone, but to make it easy, I, uh, I googled it in uh, Investipedia, and I need to, uh, and I need to uh, quote this right. So, platformification is a relatively new business model happening in fintech that is enabling companies to lift out entire operations and benefit from mutualization. I was like, all right, I need a few clever guys to uh, explain that to me, right? So uh, to start with you, um, what do you think what platformification is? Sure. Um, so I, I think that the, the definition is definitely wrong. So that's great. <laughs> mm. 
no, I don't think platformication is something that only relates to fintech or finance. Uh, I think uh, any platform or any place online where users can create uh, or add to the platform is basically a platform. Uh, so you've got any kind of platform like art platforms, you've got uh, creation platforms, you've got publishing platforms, you've got social platforms, you've got many, many different platforms. Uh, of course, you also have e-commerce platforms. And yep. if you talk about the definition of an e-commerce platform, I think it's any online place where two parties can meet and potentially trade with each other. And that, for me, is the definition of an e-commerce platform. Definition of just a platform is any online place where users can contribute. All right, and KG, and, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, what is your, or maybe the Mambu definition of a platform, no, from platformification? Yeah, so, well, first of all, that definition of platformification, no clue what, what that <laughs> means. Uh, whether it's uh, right or wrong, I could not say, uh, since I have no clue what it actually would uh, say. Uh, so we are, obviously, we are software providers. So our angle is slightly different than, for example, yours is obviously, but at the end of the day, uh, what we also see is that from my perspective, platformification is also much more about bringing, eh, as a customer, and that's in our situation, for example, a bank, being here at uh, Holland Fintech, give a customer the ability to create their own end state by bringing in various platforms that interact with each other, uh, create the best of breeds. So instead of having to buy everything from one and the same, being able to get exactly what you need for your requirements in the specific country or countries that you're active in. Okay, okay, well that's a, di that's a different view, uh, indeed. Um, any other views? Yeah, I would like to add something to that. Okay. Um, I think, I at least in, in my view, platform platformification, uh, it's a difficult word, uh, <laughs> as you mentioned, um, and try to, to give some, some substance to it, but we see it as a, um, uh, making things much easier for the client and much more transparent than it used to be. Yeah? You have the, these banking platforms are all tied up with several uh, software packages and, and platforms together. We try to well put everything in, in one place and make the connection easily for the client. So he doesn't need to bother with, okay, how do I connect with my other banking system or other platform here and there? Just make everything simple and connectable. Okay. Uh, Jeroen, agree? Yeah, per perhaps two words to, to add to that. Firstly, um, what comes to mind is that it's all about providing a one-stop shop to the customer. Uh, whereby the customer can can consume variety of solutions, not just for one for, for one product, one need, but variety of use cases. And secondly, and that's some trend we see re in recent years. It used to be all about islands, the island of Facebook and the ecosystem, and and Google, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what you now see is that also they are opening up, and it's your own services as well as third parties. And I guess that's. Uh, I guess what we can all relate to and all your services also subscribe to. Okay, well, I'll, I'll stay with you. Um, so we see new business models evolve around platformification, yeah? So what do you, th what do you see in the banking space? Um, what are the consequences for banks, for example? Yeah, so, so it's a broad topic when it comes to the consequences, but what we see is uh, one topic related to platforms is, well, firstly, was the big techs coming in that was sort of scary, and then it was a matter of sort of trying to ignore the trend. It's not happening. Well, obviously, that doesn't work, because it is. Um, and secondly, then, um, there was some realization, okay, if platform, uh, platforms are the future, we want to be the go-to platform. Every bank wanted to build some sort of financial management app. Doesn't work either, because they're not in the best position to, to do so. And what we now see slowly is the re realization that um, they have a different role in that, that they're more like the solution provider in the ecosystem and that it requires different way of thinking, different way of servicing your products, different relation with the products. And that's what only the banks start to realize now and start to explore and understand better. Okay, so the banks are actually waking up on this uh, topic. Let's say it's early morning and they start to <laughs> wake up. Okay, the alarm bell went off, at least. Yeah. So, um, uh, can I call you, uh, I know it's not there, but I call you the platform providers, right? So, so what, what do you see um, 
what kind of business models do you see? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, that th these business models open up the, the transparency in the financial world. Uh, because we, when we started the company, we said, okay, the EVIX business is the, the last banking secret. Yeah? Because it's very difficult to see exactly what, you, what markup that you, that you pay if you do a, a currency transaction. So we said, okay, we want to give more transparency to the SMEs, yeah? so, because multinationals and big corporates, they have all a professional treasury, so they exactly know what the price is, how, how products work. And we said, okay, we want to give this kind of service also to the SMEs. Eh? So the, the and SMEs represent 70% of our uh, GDP. So we think that's important. So I, th I think transparency and opening up, and it's not, it's, uh, uh, you may earn money from a client. Eh? He, he, he doesn't care. As long as he gets a good service, it's all okay. But be open and transparent about it. All right, uh, so what we see, I mean, we're a payment service provider, we do payments for marketplaces and, and platforms, so uh, we generally talk to the likes of Markplatz or eBay, um, and what we see there is they're moving from a ad-driven uh, business model towards more a, a CPS model. So uh, they integrate payments, uh, for example, C2C payments, uh, where you first just needed to contact each other on the marketplace and you just shared your, your bank account and they just wired the money. Now they integrate payments, first of all, to make a better product and user experience, um, but second, and maybe foremost, I don't know, uh, it's a CPS. So it's a new business model that's purely based on, on success of, of actually selling something and then deriving a, a cut out of that sale. So we see many classified marketplaces moving more towards kind of a typical e-commerce purchasing uh, 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 um, um, kind of platform uh, and, and using CPS as a real driver for their revenues. Um, then there's other platforms that, that have very different reasons that are not purely based on, on revenue. Uh, for example, let's take a look at IKEA. Uh, they're opening up and making a second-hand marketplace for their end users, but that's more data-driven and loyalty-driven. So they don't, uh, they don't want to drive a lot of revenues from that interaction, but they purely want to provide their end users, which are the people that have purchased previously with IKEA, a better place to you know, uh, get, get rid of their stuff and therefore having an even better and closer relationship with IKEA. So that's, that's what they're opening up their platform for. So we see a very wide range, but most of the parties that we see are really using at least our platform and, and, and the platform location uh, to drive efficiency, drive user friendliness, and drive revenue. Okay. So what's, what's your lens on this one, uh, KJ? Uh, looking at what you were just mentioning, eh, you have the traditional banks. And to be honest, I think in the Netherlands, the traditional banks are at this moment in time absolutely not moving at all, simply because they're in a very comfortable position. If you look at the big four, they have like, what is it, 80% of the market. Uh, pretty, people don't want to move. Uh, I'm also still with the same bank as I was when I was four, simply because it's easy. Um, so in the Netherlands, I don't think that there's much change happening due to the whole platformification uh, activities, open banking, etc. And there are some new entrants in the market, like yourselves, absolutely, but it's it's relatively limited. If you look, for example, outside of the Netherlands, if you go to uh, South Europe, if you go to Eastern Europe, you see tremendous amounts of opportunity, simply because the whole uh, current situation is not very good. Uh, and there is, uh, there's a couple of banks, there is a lot of uh, even still a lot of underserved people, uh, underserved bank, uh, bank people, uh, but also costs are extremely high. And so there the, um, the chances are much better than here in, uh, in the Netherlands. And, and also the banking uh, sector as a whole in Holland is very well developed. Uh, if you compare that to, to other countries in Europe, especially to, uh, but also if you go a bit east to Germany, yeah, it's, com it's really, really different than what you see in Holland. Eh? So here, the, the banking is really good developed, but if you go outside, if you go in Europe, uh, there are many chances. So are but you at the same time, it also means that for us as customers and customers of the bank, uh, that's also a downside because 
there is much more potential than we will actually get. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and even there, we, we can improve. Yeah? Yeah. yeah, I think one point we're missing is the fight for the end customer. And you're right, the banks in the Netherlands, they are sort of relatively in a comfortable position. Things are reasonably well. In the Netherlands, we're enjoying one of the most efficient banking systems. Um, so we're in a good place, but still we cannot ignore sort of platforms that are happening and the likes of Google and Apple are coming and they are trying to take over the customer and it's all about getting a monopoly on the customer, a monopoly on the services the customer uses, the data and trying to reap sort of a share out of the revenue gen generated over the customer and that really massively impacts the position of banks. Well, that's actually a nice bridge, uh, Jeroen, to, uh, to my next question, because, uh, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> you're laughing, man. Sorry. Uh, so, um, because, so this whole platformification, is that, is that a consequence of, of customer demand, or is that, are there other drivers that is driving platformification? If I may respond firstly, um, it's a mixture of events, really. It's uh, technology, obviously, developing, uh, allowing more, more possibilities. We have customer used to that digital environment and expecting a more seamless experience that everything is available right now, anytime, anywhere, in a seamless fashion. And that caters to the likes of Booking.com, Markplatz, etc. And um, also, it's new competition. Um, organizations outside of banking are moving into this platform play and embedding into banking as well. And banks need to catch up, keep up with it, to yeah, do something with their position because they are affected. Uh, do you agree on the... Well, I think it's like a kind of a natural phenomena of any capitalistic uh, play. I mean, you have to stay ahead of the curve. And, 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 and if, if others are coming around and doing stuff even better, cheaper, more efficient, more friendly, and it's more fun, then you know customers are going to go there. So uh, it's a constant game of, of innovating and, and uh, you know trying to make things better. Uh, and, and, and therefore, customers will go uh, left or right. And when they used to go right to you, and now they're going left, you're going to naturally think, why is this happening? And, and you're going to find out. And in many cases, uh, it's platformication that, that's driving them towards another place because it's more efficient uh, and, again, more fun and, and, and cheaper, etc. cetera. Uh, so if you look at like traditional uh, vacation uh, rent rentals, like first, let's say a decade ago, no, but nobody could, could rent somebody else's house somewhere in a cool place in the beach or in the Alps or, or what have you. Uh, so everybody used to just book with hotels. Nowadays, uh, lots of people are using the platforms and, and, and renting from other people because it's more fun. It's yeah. sometimes cheaper and, and more efficient. So what do the likes of booking have to do that used to just serve the hotel market? They also have to incorporate the Airbnb uh, experience. So it's it's very, very natural phenomena that, 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 that these companies are constantly trying to catch up with, with where the boundaries are being pushed. So, so uh, oh, sorry. But yeah. in the end of the yeah. day, yeah, coming back to your question, yeah. uh, it's not the end customers who demand that this needs to happen. It's much more the technology is there, uh, open banking, uh, the, the whole uh, API-based construction, structure, everything, and that enables smart people to see a hole in a market somewhere, to see an opportunity where so the big traditional, in this case banks, miss the spot, and they just jump in it, and then indeed you get what you say, uh, people go left because left is easier, quicker, and it's cheaper. Yeah. Uh, so it's also the fact that uh, there's technology and the financial industry is very slow, traditional, and old fashioned. To adopt. Yeah, so, so uh, talking about the value chain, right, in the, in, with platformifications, um, because it's the same with apps, right? I understand there are a lot of platforms possible, um, but we also know that there are a lot of financial apps, and I don't want to have 500 apps on my phone, mm -hmm. right? I want to go to one place, marketplace, where I can do all my different financial services, yeah, at my fingertip. So is that the same with platformification? I mean, do you see, um, let's call it also the, the, the big tech development that there are players in the market developing as a super platform? Uh, let's start with you. No, I, uh, 
sorry. Uh, I don't see that the, um, happening at this moment. Huh? So what I see is that you have several specialist platform, um, which are um, also focusing, first of all, on their, their service and their business model. And next to that, make the platform uh, compatible and connectivity make connect connection with other platforms uh, so that it's easy for the end customer to have one dashboard logging in uh, into one platform and th I think that's essential because if you want to do everything you're going to be the old big bank again yeah? and then your your systems will be outdated over 10 years uh, so keep up the things that you do well keep that uh, uh, improving, uh, make it keep on innovating, uh, make it agile, eh, so you can really move when things change. And I think it's dangerous to really build the, the big platform again, which covers everything. And because then I'm afraid we're gonna look like the old bank nowadays. Yeah, but we talked about capitalism, right? So everybody wants to be the 100 pound gorilla on the mountain. So somebody will grab that position. Correct? Well, yes, that's correct. But uh, the again, the 100-pound the gorilla is going to be cut up into 100 pieces at some point. So it's, it's again, kind of a wave where, look at e-commerce. When it just arrived, you had all these little shops popping up, and then you got bull.com and Amazon swallowing and being the big 100-pound uh, gorilla. Um, but now you've got several of these, and they're being, you know, so you've got Alibaba now, and Amazon, and Bull.com, and now, now you're gonna have about 20 of these 100 pound gorillas, so they're 20 pound gorillas at least, you know? So they're being cut up. So what you see is that once a big gorilla takes over the market, they're never gonna be good enough to, to, to ace every little niche that has actually happen, happening within this entire ecosystem. So another great example, I think, is like eBay. eBay used to be the one and only marketplace you should go to and sell stuff. Uh, well, nowadays, are you going to eBay to sell your ticket or to ticket, ticket swap? Or look at uh, handmade goods. Are you going to go to Etsy to send your handmade goods or to eBay? A and so on and so on. So you see that for, at some point, somebody is becoming that 100-pound gorilla but then the subcategories become that big in and by itself that it allows for a niche player to own and uh, be very much better at that very particular category or vertical. Uh, and then they swall or then they, they cut out that piece out of the 100 pound gorilla. And so they ju this just keeps happening. So every time there's gonna be gorillas coming and then the gorilla shows you which pieces they're still not doing well enough and then they're big enough for companies to to thrive just to buy that category alone. And this, again, kind of yeah, a natural I, I, phenomenon. I guess what you see is two, two main movements. One is sort of subscribing to what you're saying is sort of as opposed to one big continent, you get sort of very different islands and particularly, I guess, financial services a bit more so due to regulations, some impediments that are in the way. So you have different islands uh, for a variety of use cases and also another thing, and. I think the gentleman here can relate to that, is that it's more opening up as opposed to first it was only in one ecosystem and they could not talk to them, to, to each other, there would be closed environments. And now you see um, the industry opening up, being able to connect with multiple providers as well as also banks are acknowledging that now in sort of the BAS environment that they, as opposed to try to fight, try to keep up with customer experience, they acknowledge that they cannot keep up and they see more like a distribution channel and change their perspective, that they focus on the back end, let others do their customer experience. That's sort of trend what you see. Absolutely, and it's also about what you know as a company about your end customers. Uh, because in the, in the end of the day, data is, is key. And what you also see is that there are now also new entrants into fintech who know a lot about their own customers. If you take, for example, the telcos, uh, which is also a, a segment that we serve uh, intensively throughout the world, yeah, a, a telco knows everything about you as a, as a client. They also know how you pay. They also know how, uh, how much they can sell to you. So doing a wallet as a, uh, as a telco is a very easy step for them to take but also a very easy step for me as an end customer to actually accept. Uh, so it's, all, it's also about uh, the 100 pound gorilla. Uh, in the end of the day, it's the gorillas which serve the end customer best yeah. who will win the fight. I agree. 
And it, it, it's also thinking out of the box, are doing things differently. Yeah? I think a hot topic at this moment is compliance, for example. Yeah? What you see when we tell our clients, okay, if you want to make a cross-border payment, you have to upload the underlying invoice. Yeah? At that moment, he is making this payment, so his, the invoice is in his hand or in his desk. Yeah? So he can easily upload it. And he said, Yo, I never have to do this by, uh, at the bank. Now, that's the problem. With, that's the, the issue that the banks are facing now, repairing all the compliance issues that they have. Yeah? Because they do it afterwards. We do it up front. So it's also thinking about different processes and you know, trying to be smart on that and tackle the issue from the beginning as soon as you can. So, so just uh, just curious. So, um, your target clients are not the banks, right? Your target clients are really the end customers, correct? Yes, yes. So you're not trying to seek any cooperation with banks and say. Oh, we do. Yes, okay. yeah. We cooperate with banks. So, so we we partner with. We have we. We don't bash the banks. We want to cooperate with them because we also need them. Yeah, for the uh, for the liquidity, for example, for the currency hedging, but also for the payment platforms that we also use together with the banks. But it's it's a different kind of mindset. Eh? For example, um, the payment industry is quite um, uh, complex and for the most people, intransparent. Because if you need to make a, a dollar payment to China. Not many people, or not many of my customers at least, a small and medium-sized enterprise, know that the dollar payment always goes through a U.S. bank. Because the U.S. US government, the U.S. central bank, wants to keep grip on all the dollar payments. Yeah? So, but we make it transparent yeah, with a payment track and trace system that the client can see exactly how this payment flow develops and when the money arrives. So the banks don't like you, basically. Uh, no, they like us because uh, we are also a client of the bank, but then uh, for the treasury part. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, oh, sorry, you want to say... Uh, yeah, not just to add on that, it's, it's the point like, do you like these innovators or not? And it really requires a change in mindset. And I would say most banks are in a position that you say, we don't like it or something new and scary. And that makes a difference to the ones that do embrace it, do realize it, because that's what you need, a different mindset to these things and uh, acknowledge your strengths and your weaknesses. Okay, so le let's go back to platformification and also uh, some of the challenges. So you build a platform, let's call it that way. Eh? And um, so what are the challenges you faced the last couple of years when you build it, because? Well, okay, maybe I mean, we are called online payment platform, so I, that, that's why we think we, we built a platform. But I, I wouldn't say we are a platform, um, which kind of defeats the whole uh, <laughs> name. Uh, but we're not, because it, 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 we, we don't provide an online place where you can contribute, or do, uh, we, don't, we don't provide the place where you can trade. We merely uh, assist the place where you trade if a transaction uh, happens. Um, so if you really look at, at a platform uh, and, and look at the challenges that they face, uh, it's not the challenges that we faced. Uh, and I think the most challenging part of, uh, of, get, of, of, of building a successful online platform is first and foremost, of course, having a uh, compelling mission place or whatever, offering something that's actually different, which is yeah, can be quite hard, of course. And then if you have done that, then the second uh, hardest thing is the chicken and egg problem of platforms. So uh, most often you will, have, you will want a lot of offers and, and demand, but, but you have to have something to start off with. And you have, if you have neither, there's no reason for anybody to, to start to contribute or use your platform. So the, the, the hardest part when starting a new platform is to create uh, the traction on the platform. Uh, and well, the, the, I, I heard a pretty good advice or tip. Uh, actually, you can find it back in our, our platform stories video format that we make. We, we, we interview a lot of founders of platforms. Um, and one of them was Brenger. You might have heard of Brenger. Brenger is a uh, shipping service for, for large goods uh, in the Netherlands, but they're expanding towards uh, in Europe. Anyway, they started out and they didn't have anybody that would ship the goods, obviously. 
because there was no demand. So nobody would sign up to ship. So what they did is in the first, I think, half year, they just bought a few vans and literally the founders were shipping the goods around themselves. Just making sure that, you know, at least when somebody put up an assignment, that it was actually being handled and that there was some traction uh, taking place. So that's like the, the, the little snowflake that, snowflakes that you have to kind of drop and push yourselves for, for the avalanche at some point to take place. Um, I think that, that, that's kind of the, the hardest thing. Of course, after that, you're going to have to look at how do you scale? Uh, how do you go international? How do you comply with everything? Uh, how does your infrastructure look? How can you make, uh, can make sure that, that it's secure, that you don't breach any GDPR, etc.? But that comes later. The, mo the hardest part is making something compelling and actually getting users to use it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, or uh, instead of making something completely new, just do something which is already there, but then much better and much more suited towards the customer. Uh, if you take, for example, ABN AMRO here, well, everybody knows them. Uh, um, they had uh, already an SME lending uh, proposition where it would take you two, three weeks before you had uh, an, an offer on a loan, yes or no. And then they said, you know what, we want to do it fully online and we want to do it in like 20 minutes. Well, it was not possible. So that's when they had to go and look for a different setup, uh, a different platformification of their question and in the end created a whole new uh, layout uh, through uh, New 10, where also Mambu was part of that uh, solution, in which they were actually able to do so. So was it new? No. Was it much better than it was before? Absolutely. The user experience went up dramatically, It's the user right? experience, yep. which in the end, uh, because in the end of the day, whether you have something uh, completely new, which is great, or something which is already there and you make it better, in the end of the day, if you know how to wow your customers, you will be in the winning, uh, the winning streak. Yeah. So, so what kind of challenges did you face uh, the last couple of years? Well, we, uh, many, <laughs> of course, <laughs> many. <laughs> but uh, no, the, there, there are a few things. First of all, um, uh, it is uh, finding the right people. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a challenge. Yeah. And, but that becomes easier the more successful you are. Yeah? So I agree with you, get things rolling. That's, that's the most difficult part. So in the, in the beginning, you need funding and you need to be able to develop your ideas, eh? to get things from the ground. And uh, so you have to, to uh, uh, see it before you harvest. And that's the, the, the difficult part in well, uh, starting a new company like this. Eh? No one knows us. Uh, in the beginning. So it's really, the, you need to have the, the, the deep pockets to overcome this part, and then things are starting to roll, and then it's, uh, you're off. Okay. Yeah, so, so obviously it's a two-sided market, right? Whereby you need to have both the users and the providers, and you need them both in balance and sufficient skill to, to start. Um, I think what, what's interesting, what we see now happening is, due to technology opening up these platforms that you get sort of the, uh, how you say it, the, 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 you don't have the combination per se anymore. You can have a platform just catering to users and the user experience or at the back end, uh, platforms catering to just the banks itself that, uh, that's, that's, uh, providers can tap into. For FX, we have those solutions, white label uh, FX solutions. We, and where we're going with banking also, that you have sort of universal banking platforms that customers can sign up to and then can do their banking. So, so that, that, that's a, a change in how these, these platforms operate. Yeah, so uh, uh, let, let's elaborate on that one. So uh, can you look in your, in your crystal ball and uh, can you predict how banks will react to this whole platformification and uh, the developments around platformification and uh, the, the customer demands, basically. Yes. So a few questions in one, but if you talk about uh, banks, how they uh, react, I'll come to question four or five and six okay. later, but um, <laughs> no, if, if they react, um, I wish they would all acknowledge, and what my expectation is, is that they find it hard to actually change their mind and change the way they operate and bit by bit they're being disintermediated. They try to hold on to the front end, try to hold on to 
becoming the main app. Um, so I see them losing position, being sort of pushed to the back. Uh, some providers take it as the opportunity, sort of the bass play, whereby they just actively partner with fintechs that do the customer experience and they provide the solutions behind it. Uh, but also I think the Googles, Apples of this world will come in and bit by bit uh, banks are being marginalized and become more product factories. Okay, all right. So uh, a topic where we uh, can actually disagree uh, about because uh, <laughs> it's all too peaceful here. Um, <laughs> no, no, so uh, again, the crystal ball. Um, what would your ultimate fintech platform look like, Richard? Well, um, I think that uh, China <laughs> may not always be the best example, but they, they, they do have a pretty awesome uh, fintech platform there called Alipay. Um, and they're paving the way, I think, for, for many here, uh, uh, integrating lending in, in, inside the journey when it, the lend actually has to take place, for example. Uh, making sure that... Uh, or, or combining basically e-commerce payment flows and 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 the funds uh, with traditional banking uh, with lending therefore with insurance etc so alipay is kind of what many see here uh, in europe but also in the states as as kind of the wahala of uh, uh of, of of fintech platform um, and and uh to be honest, even for us, it, it, it is also inspiring, like uh, talking about things like lending inflow. For example, uh, to give you a, a little example of that, um, so we, we, we facilitate C2C car payments on Gumtree UK. Gumtree is the largest marketplace in UK, and there, uh, when you want to purchase a car from each other, obviously you're going to come around and look at the car, and then at some point you want to make, make a, pay, a payment for the car. And uh, once you want to do that, we use open banking to, to initiate the payment, but also use AIS, so account information, to even check before if they even have enough funds. And if they don't, you can immediately allow them, you can, you can scan their whole settlement statements, etc., and know what they could potentially uh, uh, lend. And then within a split second, you can allow them, for example, to, to, to lend a thousand pounds on top of the four thousand because they can't afford the 5,000 at that very moment. So that I think is, is very smart because it, it brings huge efficiency uh, because it's, it, it, you actually uh, engage at the moment where, where, where it's required. Um, and I think that, that those are the things that, that, that these reincorporate and I think that there will never be uh, one uh, overall uh, platform in terms of finance that rules everything like in China with Alipay because the market dynamics here are just way different which is much better uh. okay. at the same time if you look at Alipay you're creating uh, they are creating a million pounds gorilla there at this moment in time which we just concluded will not uh, will not be the uh, the right uh, end solution no, it's not the right end solution, but then they're not a real capitalistic society, so they won't have the problem, or actually, they, they won't see that many niche players popping up, because they'll be, they'll be killed. So, I mean, pushed down, repressed, or whatever. Uh, so that, that's, luckily here, we have a real a capitalistic society, at least something I, I, I like. Um, and, and, and here you won't see that happening, because everybody can participate in the play, and, 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 and governments are actually trying to reduce powers becoming too big at one center, yeah. central state. But, but at, at the same time, eh, just yep. also coming back to your point, uh, also made be, uh, by Jeroen, uh, looking at will there be a platform, the platform that will, uh, will be overall? No, I don't think so at all. It will be much more about seamless integration. Uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at Apple Pay, uh, I use also Apple Pay as the only way to pay. But does that make me an Apple Customer? No, I'm still the customer of the Rabobank. I'm still the customer of the same old traditional bank. At the same time, eh, if you know how to seamlessly integrate the different solutions which are out there, then eh, you can be 
a player in that uh, in that space. But in the end, we still do a nice uh, location somewhere in on Ibiza via Airbnb, a traditional hotel for the for the business trip we do via Booking.com, and we still pay uh, via uh, Apple Pay or Google Pay. Yeah, but I still have a, a problem with uh, thinking that through, right? Because if you if you look at the value chain and you have uh, different platforms integrating, all seamlessly integrating together, and I'm an end customer, mm. and I pay something for a service or a good, and it goes wrong, who, who am I going to call? I mean... That, de that depends on what kind of <laughs> platform that you use. <laughs> yeah? sure. exactly. Because what I mentioned earlier, if I have an issue with my LinkedIn profile, there's no telephone number. You can't call anyone. Yep. Yeah? So, and, and that's also why we say, okay, the platform is important. It is supportive to our service, but there's always the human touch because in, we are in the finance industry. The, the volumes that our clients trade are not uh, in the hundreds, but they are in the hundred thousands or the millions. Yeah? So trust is also a very big part of the, of the, the service that we offer. Okay, but do you feel responsible? I mean, do, do yes. you do KYC, the AML, the fraud detection, those kind of things? Yes. You, you do yes. it? Yep. All right, yep. okay. And if my payment doesn't uh, receive, doesn't come into China, I'm going to call you. You can correct? call us, yes, correct. Okay. All right. And we solve it. All right. So what's your view on the uh, ultimate uh, yeah, I have a slightly finance. different view. So it's uh, really the question, will there be one big giant winner, winner takes all, or various platforms? In my ultimate vision, the question will it happen, but it's a better place whereby there are multiple platforms and they are decoupled from the solutions that they offer. So do, you do not have to go to Markplatz itself for the Markplatz yeah, products offered or bowl or you name it but you can have another platform that has a better UX tailored to your needs and they integrate together and thereby it's more competition on the customer experience, the prices, level of service, etc. as opposed to the size of the platform and that, that, that's well what it has become now, sort of monopolies on their own ecosystems and I'd like the world to go to more open, more independent places that compete more on the value and customer experience they provide. Are there any different views otherwise we have a few minutes left so m is it nice maybe to uh, are there any urgent or nice just nice questions from the audience I have. All right. because if you talk about customer and we're talking about collaboration today also about ESG aren't we going kind of away from the whole gorilla uh, thinking um, and to what extent because in the in the beginning of the discussion you were very much talking about uh, um, frictionless and uh, ease but aren't people becoming more and more aware of what they're actually doing and with whom they're doing that with what their footprint is what their social impact is etc and isn't that what this is all about and aren't we maybe going beyond the whole platform thinking isn't it something because we're decentralizing in all kinds of ways actually yes it, uh, who wants to pick up this question <laughs> I, I, I can kick yeah. off yeah of course no but i think uh, uh, you have a really good point because uh, if you look at a traditional bank he does everything we pick out one specific service that we try to do best yeah, better than the others and um, that's why we want to stand out and we hope that our uh, 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 companies choose our service eh? because we do it nicer or better or cheaper or faster, whatever. Um, so, I th and I also think there is place for several competitors, and it's also good to have competition because then you keep also innovation. Because if there's no competition anymore, uh, then you can relax and sit back, and then nothing is going to happen anymore. So, you need competition and you need several boutiques where you can choose from and which suits you best. That's what I think. Uh, but it's also what you, it's also what you used to, huh? because if you look at uh, 
uh, if you look at us, uh, five uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch men on, on a row, uh, we're all banking most likely with a tr one of the traditional uh, Dutch uh, banks uh, here. If I look at my, uh, my colleagues who uh, in Amsterdam come from anywhere in the world, all of them, they go for the likes of an N26 as a provider, simply because they go mental with the whole KYC and the whole way of how the Dutch banks operate. So it's also about perception of how you look at uh, things. And to be honest, I think if you look at ESG and these, these kind of things, I think that is a very, very small portion of, of how people uh, look. It's much more, it's really all about customer experience. If you bring the right customer experience and your costs are reasonable, not even good, but reasonable, you're already in the safe zone. Yeah, uh, talking uh, about your initial question about ESG and platforms, I'd like to iterate a few points. Firstly, it's all about the customer. And if the customer cares about ESG, and obviously it is, it's becoming more important, that will determine the faith of the platforms that not meet those, those needs. And second point I want to iterate, it's about multiple islands or multiple platforms that I, that I see arising. And there will be more room, more burr for new places that have a better eye for ESG as opposed to the traditional big giants like Amazon or such or alternatives we can think of. So that, those are the developments that I see. All right. Unfortunately, guys, um, we have to close off. Um, I do think we touched upon on what platformification is, what kind of business models that are out there, and also what it means for uh, clients like us but also for your clients, uh, KG. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to us, and uh, I want to close off, and I want to thank the panel for uh, being on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you.